What's up, basketball coaches, players, and fans? Welcome back to the Pass First podcast where we share our knowledge of the game. My name is Augie Johnston, and I'm here with my partner, Alex Angle. And we hope you're able to take something away from today's episode that's going to help you in your basketball journey. Today, we're going to be talking about what it's like to take over a high school program, as both of us have recently done that. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So let's go ahead and get right into today's episode. All right, you guys, so like I just said, um, both of us have recently taken over high school programs or became varsity coaches at different schools. Uh, Alex is at Morro Bay. I'm at Atascadero High School. And we're just going to kind of share our experiences today and what it was like taking over a program and some things that we found that were useful so that we can share them with you. Um, I personally took over, I think I'm about two years ago and Alex is about one year ago he took over that program. So I got two seasons. He's got one under his belt and let's go ahead and just get right into it. So right when you took over, um, kind of the first thing you had to do probably was to think about, you know, your staff, your JV, your freshmen, your assistants. What was that like? What was some things that you um, thought about and considered when doing that? Um, I mean, the first thing was I wanted to make sure I found someone that was, uh, what I would consider qualified. Uh, you know, I think, especially at the high school level, it can be tough to find really good help um, on your coaching staff because, you know, let's be honest, like the pay is not great. You're, you're getting paid a stipend and you're looking for people that just really love the game and want to be around it. Um, so it's not like in college where you can say, Hey, I'm going to give you $60,000 to come be an assistant or a hundred thousand dollars to be an assistant. Like it doesn't work like that. So you're, you're trying to find someone that loves the game and knows the game um, to bring on with you. So I was fortunate. I, there was a, one of my assistant coaches, that was there the previous year under the previous coach. Um, and she was a, you know, a four year college basketball player, all conference player. And so I was able to keep her and retain her, uh, which was great because to get that type of a help as a, as an assistant, um, at the high school level is, you know, that's, that's like the top shelf that you can get. Um, and then, you know, from there as a freshman coach, I was looking for someone again, that, that maybe I knew that, um, I could trust and that again, knew the game. And so I was able to uh, hire another, play former player of mine or former uh, person that I trained and has coached with us with both of us actually or played with us and coached with us. And, uh, and so he became my freshman coach and he was a younger guy. Um, you know, and, and I think that's another thing is a lot of times you're looking for, not always, but a lot of times you're trying to look for like younger, younger guys or girls that are trying to come in and maybe either grow their resume or they just, just, you know, finished playing a few years ago and they want to stick around the game. Um, so there was just some of the things that I thought about and I was fortunate, like I said, I, I had two great assistant coaches that really knew the game and brought a lot of energy. So um, that was kind of my thought process with it. Nice. Yeah, I, I think that's all great stuff that you can take away from me. I remember looking around and when I had to hire a freshman coach, we already had JV coach in place that I was super happy with. Um, but I remember having to hire a freshman coach and just look, what I did was just kind of look around who's actually out there coaching in the rec leagues, coaching little club teams and somebody that I knew personally. So that's, that was kind of my strategy. Um, in selecting my freshman coach and I already had an assistant coach because it was the same assistant that I had as a when I was a freshman coach and stuff so all that just worked out good for me but I think that's a super important part when you take over a program it's the first thing you kind of look at and I remember sitting down with my athletic director and him you know asking who do you want freshman who do you want JV and you know and he even asked you know the people that are in place right now those aren't your guys you can hire someone else if you want and uh, luckily I didn't have to do that because I actually was really happy with them so I guess kind of the next thing you want to consider when taking over a program is style of play. Are you going to come in and are you going to change everything up or are you going to keep everything the same? Are you going to do a hybrid? What was your kind of thought with that? So I, I wanted to first make sure that I saw, you know, what I had. Um, I think you can't really know until you see your team for a little bit, that first couple of weeks or whatever, unless obviously you have part background knowledge, like with you, since you were already in the program as a freshman coach, you had some of an idea of what, what you were getting. Um, for me, I was coming in from a college and, you know, I'd seen the team play maybe one time previously. So I didn't really know a whole lot about the team when I took them over. Um, so my philosophies were different than the previous coach on certain areas. Some areas they were similar, but most areas they were different. So I kind of, wiped everything clean. Um, you know, I did run some offenses and some styles that were similar to what he ran, but that was only by accident. It wasn't because like I kept his stuff. Um, you know, I would put something in and my players would be like, Oh yeah, this is kind of similar to what we did last year, you know? So I, I pretty much wiped the, the, the slate clean and, and started over. 
Um, because I felt like in order to really bring the program around to what I wanted, they had to be all in with, with the offenses, with the defensive style. And it was quite a change. Like some of the stuff that we were running was so different from the previous year that it took them time to really learn and understand, you know, the nuances of what I wanted on offense or the nuances of what I wanted on defense as well. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like, um, we were a little bit different in that area. I, I did do a lot of new stuff, but, um, I really wanted to keep as much as I could from uh, the previous coach. So for us, yeah, we did a lot of things different, but we tried to keep a lot of out of bounds plays. We tried to keep a couple um, press breaks, maybe um, just so that the learning curve wasn't as great for the players. But, um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of coaches take over programs and really come in and not change anything in that first year. And I specifically can remember a school called Napomo. They got a new coach and he came in and and we saw them playing in the summer or something and they won by like 30. And I was just like, how did you just come in and, you know, have your team play so well all of a sudden, learn all your stuff. And he's like, I didn't change anything. I, I learned what they were doing. And um, it really, it's just the kids. I'm just rolling the ball out there right now. And the kids are just out there, you know, balling out. And so I was like, okay, I, I do see some value in that. If you come into a program where you're like, Hey, I really like what they're doing. Then I think don't change it. Right. That's going to, benefit you in the short term maybe not the long run but uh in the short term but I, I agree you have to see what your players are like who you have and then um you know kind of have a balance I guess between you know your personal philosophies and how you think the game should be played and and what you got so uh that yeah. style of play is there anything else you wanted to add on there I was just gonna say I think it I think it definitely depends like you said on what you're walking into if you're walking into like a you know this coach that's been there for 25 years and they're like a championship contender every year and going deep into CIF and he just retired you know you might want to keep a lot of that stuff because obviously he's been doing something right but if you're walking into a program that's been winning three games for the last eight years straight like you probably want to switch something up because obviously what they've been doing has not been working you know so that's just kind of just some again it's not like a one-size-fits-all but those are some ways that i look at it is you can kind of gauge it depending on what you're walking into okay so taking over a program there's a lot of different responsibilities uh one of them is uh figuring out your game schedule so when you did take over what time what part of the year was it I took over in the spring. I think it was like late April, early May. Okay. So you're probably not really looking at game schedules at that point. You're looking more at summer. So how did you plan out your summer? Did you even have a summer? It's pretty late notice. What was that looking like? Yeah. So I had to scramble to get a summer going because, you know, like you said, by early May, you know, by, by the time we actually started our first practice, it was probably like first, second week of May. Um, Cause you know, I, I got hired then a couple of weeks before I meet with the team and then we actually can get in the gym so I just had to scramble and I was fortunate enough that there was a couple tournaments locally that I was able to go to. Um, and then I got us to get out of the area and go down to Oxnard and play in a tournament, which was like a, actually a really, really good summer tournament with some, uh, a few teams down there. Um, that part of California for girls basketball is actually really, really strong. So there are some teams down there that were like top 10, top 20 teams, you know, uh, in the state. Um, and we didn't play those teams, but we did play a couple teams that were just, you know, high level, consistent, going to CIF, deep into CIF teams. And it was, you know, it was good for us because we got our butts kicked. I mean, we didn't have a strong summer, but once we did that and then we came back here where, you know, the teams were not quite as strong uh, on a you know, consistent level, I think it helped us in the long run. Cause when you see yourself, you play a team that's really, really good in the summer and you're like, Hey, okay, we hung with them. Like, yeah, they beat us, but we hung with them. We just need to fix a few things and we can, we can hang with them more, maybe even get a chance to win. I, it slowly builds that confidence, you know? Um, and I'm not a huge, like, moral victory person to be like, oh, we almost won. But there is something to be said about playing tough competition and being like, okay, I see we can hang with this team. So when we play teams that are not as good, like, we know we can beat them. So that was what I kind of tried to get us uh, in the summertime. Yeah, I can relate to that my first year taking over and having maybe a month before summer started and stuff. And I remember getting our butts whooped that summer a, a, a couple times. And um, I just remember trying to, okay, let's put, let's put it in an offense and three practices and then go and play a bunch of games. And it's challenging, no doubt. Um, okay, so what, what would you say is like your ideal summer schedule? Like, are you looking to play 30 games? How many games are you trying to play in the summer? Mm, maybe like I, I don't know if I'd do 30 but maybe like 20 you know 15 20 ish I like uh usually 
like what I've done in the summer is, and what we would have done this past summer, if not for all the COVID stuff was we play in June, you play three, maybe four tournaments. Uh, you know, you get like four games in a tournament or so. Um, and so if you do that for four weeks, you're going to get like 12 games. If you can find a few more games to get in there, maybe to get up to like 15, even 20. I mean, nowadays, sometimes it's hard to find tournaments. Like I remember when we were in high school, I remember playing June and July. And nowadays I feel like you don't find as many tournaments in July anymore. That's kind of like an off time. So I think, you know, 15 games ish to, to 20, if you really want to pack it out, I guess you might be able to, if you go all the way through, but most tournaments are four games, maybe five, you know, a weekend. So uh, we play usually through June and then in July um, I kind of give them a couple weeks off and then mid July we come back and start practicing, getting ready for, for the season. So that's kind of my, I guess, ideal system there. And we practice about, I go usually four times a week. So you're practicing, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, potentially. And then if you have a tournament like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or something like that. So you're going, you know, five, six days a week during that time. Um, and it, it can be a lot of work, but I think you have to do that to build up for the upcoming season. Yeah. I think it kind of depends too on what school you're at, because um, I know like some schools where they really promote uh, players to specialize in one sport, you can do a lot more in the summer. Like you could do a full June and July schedule and, um, for us, where we have a lot of multi-sport athletes, uh, they're doing football in the summer. They're doing baseball sometimes in the summer, and they're also doing basketball. So that's how we do it. We ended in June. Once once July hits, you know, we're just going to do a couple practices a week, and um, and that's it. So I think there's something to set something to be said to um, having you know giving the kids some time off once once July hits to be kids and have a good summer. Yeah. And you don't want to burn them out. And, you know, I, I talked to a coach who said, Hey, when I, and he's a college coach now. And he said when he was coaching high school and he was very successful at the high school level. And he was like, you know, I used to do two days a week in the summer practice and then play games. And that was it. And for me, I'm like two days, like, that's just to me, you know, I was like, that's not enough. But, but again, it was my first year. So I had to implement everything. So I was like, there's no way I can get it all in with two days. However, maybe as I move forward, you know, and I have kids that are in the program and now they know my stuff. I may reduce it back. I don't know if I'll go two days. I mean, who knows, maybe, but I might reduce it back. And instead of going like four days in a tournament, I might say, all right, let's just go three or, you know, let's, let's, let's figure out a way to, to ease off. Cause burnout is a thing, you know, and as a high school coach, you have to realize not every kid, to be honest, most kids, they're not trying to go play past high school. So they're not going to put in that time. You know, I mean, we want them to, we love them to, but if you burn them out and they don't have fun, then they're going to struggle on the court and you may lose them, you know, and that's, that's the biggest thing there. If you lose the kids then all that work is for nothing. Yeah, no, I totally, totally agree. Um, so when it comes to scheduling games, I mean, it's not, if we, we both took over in the spring, so we didn't just go ahead and start scheduling games right away. We looked at summer first, but when it comes to scheduling games, is there any strategy there or what was, how did that work for you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the basic strategies for me is like, I, I don't like playing back to back games. I don't like playing, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, if it's a tournament, that's one thing, but just single games, not a fan of it. I'm a big preparation person. I like having film. I like going over scouting reports. Um, I know some coaches don't, you know, do that as much at the high school level, but I think probably because I was used to, to coaching at the college level, that's just what you do, you know, and I like personally, if I can make it two days before a game, that's ideal, like two days of prep time, you know, before each game, but that's not always possible. So if I can at least get one day, um, that's why I try and schedule um, my ADs does a really good job of working with me and being like, Hey, you know, what teams do you want to play? And then he'll play some for me and I'll just say, Hey, just don't give me any back to backs, but you can play some kind of however you want. And it, it's, you know, it works pretty well. We kind of have a nice little ebb and flow there. But I guess that's one thing I was looking for. Um, I want to play some strong teams in the preseason. And I also want to play some teams that are just a little bit like at our level or below us so that you can pick up some wins and you get the confidence rolling and then you play those tough teams. And I, I call them like 50, 50 games where it could go either way. Um, and you know, if, if they don't go your way and you lose your, all your 50, 50 games, you want to have some games that you know are probably for sure. So you don't go, you know, like, Oh, and 10 in the preseason, but at the same time, you don't want to just play a bunch of cupcakes because it doesn't prepare you for league. If you play better teams, I think in the preseason than what you're going to play in league. And once you get to league play, you're going to do better because you're used to playing that type of talent. Yeah. I saw that in college as a player. Um, we had one coach that was scheduling all these D ones and there's like the hardest preseason ever. And our, our record was terrible. Our, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think we lost like six in a row to start the season. And you know, in college that like you fell in the pressure then, especially as a coach, but mm -hmm. um, 
it worked out for us. Once we hit our conference games, I think that was our best uh, season CSU and B has ever had. We, we finished tied for third. And, uh, and you can look back and be like, hey, you know, we did lose to Fresno State. We did lose to St. Mary's. You know, we did lose to Santa Clara. But we played them tough. And although those, although those were L's on our, on our, our, our schedule, on our record, um, you know, it, it did make us better. Uh, for me at the high school level, as far as scheduling games, like I agree with you, I, I try to do the same thing. I try to schedule a tournament that I know we can win. I try to schedule a tournament that we probably aren't picked to win. Um, and just having that balance, right? You don't want to just like make your schedule so hard that you're just losing all these games, not only just for your record, but just for like your morale and stuff. Like, you know, you mm -hmm. want it to be a good experience for the kids and, and to win games. So, um, but luckily our AD does most of our scheduling. I think just one thing that wasn't mentioned was that, you know, you want to, if you take over a program, you want to build relationships with all the tournaments that you went to before you got there, right? You want to make sure you reach out to that, that guy that runs that tournament so that you can kind of keep those relationships, keep those connections so that you can continue to go to those tournaments. Yeah. And I also, am a, I don't know how you feel about this, but I, I'm a big fan of going to at least one tournament that's like out of the area. Um, that ideally you can go and stay the night for a couple nights because it's a cool experience for the kids and it, for I think for them it's a big like bonding experience you know it's they can spend time together away from home they're on you know kind of semi on their own out there with you obviously and uh, it just builds that kind of team camaraderie and I think those those can be important and you know where you go I don't even know if that's as important as just going somewhere yeah no I totally agree that's you know, they ask every senior night, we ask our, our seniors, you know, what was your best experience or favorite moment of the year? And they always seem to mention the Carpinteria tournament when we all get to go down and stay in hotels mm -hmm. and do all that. So that's a good point. Okay, so you have taken over, you've got your summer done with, you know, it's season's coming in close, you have got to pick your team. Okay, so what are some things you think about when you're running tryouts? Yeah, so for for tryouts, I mean, for me, this past season, my experience with my, you know, quote unquote tryouts was more like who's going to make JV and who's going to make varsity. I didn't have the numbers to be like, okay, I'm going to be cutting people away from the program completely, you know? Um, so when I'm looking for tryouts, I'm looking for who knows our offenses and defenses, like who really knows them. Obviously there has to be a baseline talent level. So that's, I mean, I think first comes first is there's got to be that baseline talent level. Like, can you play at the varsity level and actually produce, right? Um, and then from there, you got to look at, okay, do you know all your plays? How much production would I get from you if I'm watching you play? Like, okay, is it someone that I can stick in and yeah, you might be able to play for one minute and that's it. Well, maybe you're better to play on JV where you can actually get a lot of playing time. Um, you know, obviously you got to look at, at the size of the players. Uh, even in high school, you know, people, I think sometimes forget about that, but in college you're recruiting for height in high school, it's the same idea. You know, if you're a post player and you're, you know, on the girl side, 5'10", 5'11", is decent height. Um, you're going to have a better chance of making it on a varsity than if you're a five foot four post player. Like it's just, it is what it is. Um, so you're looking at, at those types of things. Um, but I think really just understanding the game and the speed of the game, because between JV and freshman and varsity, there is quite a shift in speed and size and, and understanding of, of how the game is played. So those are kind of, you know, I'm sure I could go into every little detail, but just overall, I'm just looking for those type of things because, uh, like I said, first things first is you got to be able to have that baseline of, of ability to play. And then from there, we kind of look forward. Yeah, I agree with that. That's uh, kind of what I do too. I like to have my tryouts be kind of heavy in just letting them play and heavy in challenging their IQ, basically, because it's easy for you to say, all right, it's, it's kind of like an open gym right now. You guys are going to play five on five. I'm going to, you know, evaluate. I got the clipboard. And you're like, wow, this player right here looks really good. And then you're like, okay, next thing we're going to do is you guys are going to have to run this play. Here's how it goes. And then all of a sudden this player like can't do it. And you're just like, mm. you know, it mm -hmm. just makes you question, not that you're going to cut him or anything, but um, you know, it just makes you think, okay, you know, we're looking for players that can do both that can play, you know, in an organized system. And of course, you know, find success and create plays and make plays in that system. So um, for me personally, I mean, I, I did have to cut maybe one or two players last year, but it wasn't, I didn't have any kind of challenges where I was like, Oh, I got to go between these two players. They're so borderline. It was, it was pretty clear. Um, mm -hmm. The players that I did cut that, you know, they hadn't played organized ball in, in, in a lot of years. So mm. um, yeah, that's kind of my thought on, on tryouts. And when you come in to take over a program uh, and you don't know, right. you really don't know who's who. 
uh, it makes it a lot more challenging. So it, when you took over, like, what was your, your knowledge of the players that were coming to try out before that? Very minimal. I mean, when I first got them and you're talking about like when I picked them up in the spring, when I first yeah. took over the program. Yeah. I mean, it was very minimal. Like I, I knew who some of the players were that were, you know, the better players because I talked to either my AD or even the previous coach a little bit and, or my assistant who was there last year and just found out some stuff. But, um, but other than that, you know, or, you know, looking at stats and what they averaged the previous year, I didn't really know anything. I'd never seen them play. You know, I, I did watch them once the previous year, but that wasn't, it just wasn't something that I was going and doing. So I didn't have a whole lot of information on them. Um, so I kind of, we did play a little bit, but for me, I had to get into the organization stuff really quickly, like in the spring and in summer and even in the fall, because like I said, I had to change so much, like a complete philosophy change to where I couldn't just sit there for like weeks and be like, all right, you guys play for like two or three weeks and I'll kind of watch and figure it out. It was like, no, we will play a little bit organized, but we've got to get these plays in. we got to get these defenses in. Like we got to get, you know, even just your basic fundamentals have to change. Um, so it was kind of a different experience for me. And, and kind of to just, I know there's a little bit of a tangent, but to touch back on the point you said about being like an open gym player. Um, I think sometimes coaches don't realize that like you can get a player that's really good in open gym and then you put them in a, in a situation where they got to do plays or organize basketball and they can drop really badly. And I've seen, I've seen it even at the college level where you got kids that come in and open gym and you're like, Oh man, this guy's just going to kill this year. He's going to average like 20. And then they get to the season and he's averaging like one point and barely gets off the bench because just can't do it in a real game, you know, it just doesn't click. Um, so yeah, don't, you know, don't put, uh, sometimes people put too much into open gym and it's, it's good. There's value there, but it's not everything. It's not the same as playing in a real game where you, where the defense is set and you know, the offense has got plays and all that. So. Okay. Um, as far as taking over program and there's a lot of things you've got to kind of install or establish, like, you know, what are you going to wear on the road? What are you going to do in warmups? How are you going to fundraise? Let's talk a little bit about that a little bit. So did you have any kind of crazy travel gear rules when you came in? Did you change any of that or how did that go? Yeah. So I got the team, uh, you know, a travel top, a jacket and a bottom. Um, I, you know, we were able to fundraise some money for that. And so I purchased everyone that and I said, look, when we travel, you need to wear that. Um, at first I had them wearing that even on game days, you know, like they had to wear it on game days at home, but they would, they asked sometimes like switch it up and do something different as long as they were all doing it together. And so I was kind of lenient. I try not to be like super stickler on the, on the travel gear as far as what, you know, wearing it on game day or stuff, because I don't know how much that really matters. You know, I think coaches used to make a really big deal out of that, but I don't, I don't think wearing it at school all day really makes a big difference. But when we are traveling on the road, I was like, you got to be wearing your gear. You can't just be one person with a Morro Bay jacket on, someone else with some other random shirt on, someone else, you know, it just, you don't look professional. You look like ragtag and I want us to look professional everywhere we go. So when we're out in public, we're on the road, wear your travel gear, you know, at home or whatever on game day, it's not as big of a deal, but just make sure when you're in the gym, we all look uniform, we all look the same. So that was at least up for the travel stuff. When you were in high school, did you got, what were you guys um, wearing on the road and stuff? Did you guys wear ties? No, we had same thing. We had uh, sweatsuits. So we had like gray sweatsuits or blue sweatsuits that we wore. So okay, I never yeah. did the suit and tie. <laughs> when I was uh, in high school, it was like a mandatory tie. tie. Anytime you had a game, you had to wear a tie. You had to wear it to school. You had to wear it to the game. And uh, when I took over the program here, that was also still a thing. And that was one thing that I kind of cut out. And uh, some people were like, yeah. And some people were like, what are you doing, man? Tradition and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But um, what I told the guys was, hey, we will have tie games. So if we're playing Paso on a Friday night or, you know, whatever, we're like we're going to make it a tie game and stuff. But in the end, when it came down to, it, we had like maybe one tie game the whole year, my first year, maybe one the second year. And, you know, the thing about the whole tie thing, and I get it, you know, you want to teach these kids to, you know, how to dress up, how to tie a tie. Like that's where the value comes in. But for me, it was like, man, these kids are wearing the same shirt, like 20 times, a year with the same tie and they're only wearing it for that one second. The other time it's just hanging there and the shirt's all dirty and they don't, it's not ironed and that kind of stuff. So I just was like, Hey, we're going to buy some travel gear. And, and we, and that's kind of the, the way we went, but I'm still not a stickler on that kind of stuff. Like I'm not a stickler on headbands and wristbands. And I know some coaches are, I, I, I'm not like only thing I really care about is the actions you are taking on the floor, you know, are you looking, are you playing professionally? Are you looking professionally on the court? Are you, you know, making your hustle plays and all that kind of stuff? Like that's where I just, 
focus 100% attention and most coaches don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I'm kind of in agreement. Like there are, is there a, is there a standard I want to set? Yes. You know, I don't want to just say, do whatever you want. There's a, like you said, you want to look professional, but beyond that, you know, if one, one of my players wants to wear a undershirt or compression top or compression pants, that's her choice. You know, if another one doesn't want it, that's your choice. As, as long as the uniform on top is all the same, you know, I'm not too concerned about whatever else you've got on, but some coaches are like really anti I've played for coaches that are like, Oh no, either we all wear compressions and they're all the same color or nobody wears them, you know, or I've even had coaches says no compressions. I don't care what it is. I personally don't get it. You know, I think it's just kind of like an old school thing, but, um, but yeah, for me, it's not that big of a deal. Okay. So that's travel gear. What about warmups? Like, uh, and we're talking about like pregame warmups. Um, mm -hmm. did you, how did you kind of plan that out? Yeah. So I'm, I'm probably one of those rare coaches. I don't want to say rare, but I feel like there's a lot of coaches that are like, all right, warmups, just go out and do your layups, you know, and they just go out, teams just go out and do layups for 20 minutes. I'm not a fan of that. Um, coach Blair at Cuesta was very organized with his warmup. He had a preset routine. If you ever, watch the game you would see we had a 20 minute routine and it was like to a t everything was you know drilled out i like that because i think doing layups for 20 minutes gets boring it gets tiring honestly you're like all right i've been doing this for so long um it's good to have something that switches it up so we actually probably about a month before our first game i brought in a little mini speaker put it in the middle of the court showed them what our warm-up routine was and we for like two weeks straight every day our warm-up was that 20 minute warm-up routine and i'd turn the music on i'd be like look this is how it's going to be just like in the game you're going to hear this music playing i made them make their warm-up list you know threw it on there and so every day for two weeks straight they did that warm-up before we did practice and then they knew it you know it was just like okay this is second nature then once we got into the season it was it was pretty simple um and sometimes, you know, you don't always get the amount of time, you know, in high school, sometimes all of a sudden they're like, oh, you get a five minute warm up. You're like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but then they would just cut out. I said, okay, well, if that happens, make sure you know what you want to cut out so that you still get a good warm up in. Um, and that was pretty seamless and it worked really well for us. So, so what are some of those things um, that you guys are doing in, in that warm up? Um, we do, I mean, we do some layup lines. We do, um, I do some defensive closeout stuff and some defensive slide stuff, you know, not too long, but where they're closing out to kind of like the volleyball line and then they're sliding one direction or sliding another direction back to the baseline. Uh, we do some dribble attack and kick, you know, out for a shot so that you're used to like a game situation where someone's going to kick it to you. Um, we do, I do like a bigs and smalls where one group stretches and the other group gets shots up on their own. Um, you know, just all different types of things like that. Oh, we do a little shell drill at the end. Uh, for like three, four minutes. So again, just trying to keep it live. And, and I'm, I'm sometimes hesitant on that because I'm always worried someone's going to go too hard and trip on someone's ankle, you know, and sprain their ankle in the warm-up. So I tell the girls, I like, look, just, this is not real shell drill. We're not going hundred percent. Just kind of move that ball and get the use of, of, of spacing on offense and understand the rotations on defense and then just get a shot up. Like, don't worry about, we're not trying to, to lock down right now. So those types of things just to get the body moving. Yeah, I think that's one thing that a lot of warm up routines are missing is some sort of decision making. Like I, I always want to make sure I include at least one kind of drill that's like a decision making drill, whether it's just like a two on one coming back from half court or something. Um, because I just feel like it, you know, you want to get your shots, you get your shots. It's just like so much mindless stuff that happens in warm ups to where you're not really getting your mind warmed up. And if, you know, all of a sudden that ball goes up and you're not ready to make good decisions and, and, you know, and be kind of just intelligent with the ball, then that first quarter can, can hurt you. So um, that, but, but, but with that said, I do worry about the injury thing, right? If we're going live, a live thing where there's some decisions being made and it's like a little bit of a game, then there's, there's definitely opportunity for a twisted ankle or something like that. But, you know, I think if you communicate it with the, the, the players, it's not too hard for them to be like, Hey, we don't have to go all out. Okay. You know? Yeah. Cause they're yeah. just trying to like get warmed up and bob their head. I want my players to feel good during warmups. Um, unlike you, I don't, I don't do a lot of defensive stuff cause I used to hate that as a player. And mm -hmm. so, uh, personally, I, we don't do a lot of defensive stuff, but we might next year do, um, just a quick little shell drill. I think there's definitely like some, uh, intimidation stuff that comes along when you're doing defense and warmups that, you know, you look over and you're like, dang, these guys are doing closeouts right now. What the heck? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's keep, let's keep moving on then. So let's talk a little bit about fundraising. So, um, that's one thing that, every program definitely needs and what was kind of your did you have to learn a little bit about fundraising when you took over did you already know what you were going to do or just kind of ramble a little bit about that 
Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, I had done some fundraising previously with other programs that I've been a part of. So uh, I had ideas, um, but they had a couple new ones that I didn't even know about. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you remember back in the day, like we had to send letters out to people for fundraisers. Um, you know, hey, uncle, whatever, please mm -hmm. donate money to the program. And so now they have things that you can do them online and there's different programs where it's just all virtual and it's emails that get sent out. And, um, and our school does that. And that really, they actually already were implementing that. So I kind of had to adopt that, but I was, I was planning on doing something similar anyways. So that worked out well. Um, you know, camps did, did, a, did a summer camp, did some fundraising that way. Um, you know, I, I thought about maybe hosting a tournament to, to, to fundraise as well. Cause that's another great way to, to do some fundraising is to get teams to come out, especially like summer tournament this, this summer, we actually had a summer tournament planned. Um, and we were going to get teams from you know the Valley coming out here. I had teams actually all like ready to go. And then obviously everything got shut down, but just things like that. Those are, those are ways to try and fundraise. I know there's other ways people do, you know, a gear sale where they sell, you know, Morbid high sweatshirts or whatever. I'm not a huge into that. I guess if you're really good at it, you can make a lot of money, but I feel like the amount of work you have to put into that compared to how much you get out of it is not a whole lot. So I've kind of not done a whole lot with that, but, but yeah, those are some of the ways that I have done fundraising. Yeah. And I think for any coach that does take over a program, like that's probably one of the first questions you should ask your AD is, Hey, like what, what kind of fundraisers do we already have in place? You know, what are my options? Um, and that kind of stuff. Cause at our school, a lot of our fundraisers are already like set up, like, when I took over, I remember he was like, okay, you know, May 22nd, you got to be here. We're running uh, like this barbecue thing that makes like $10,000. So I was like, okay. And, um, and so, yeah, I was able to just map out a couple things and it, it worked out good for us. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about culture and, you know, coming into a, a program that you're taking over might have, you know, different philosophies, different culture than, than you have. And, you know, it's kind of a cliche term, change the culture or we're trying to change the culture and I, you know, in a way that's a little bit offensive to whatever coach was in there before, you know, I think if another coach was to take over my program, I wouldn't want him saying, Oh, I'm gonna change the culture. I need to change the culture. But um, I guess what it really means is you want to just kind of modify the culture to be, to fit your philosophies and, and your, your, what you got going on. So what were some things that you had to do or change uh, culture wise? Um, a couple of them were just like, well, I could say probably the first and main one was um, making sure that you're showing up on time and making sure that like you understand this is a commitment and that you need to be here unless there's an emergency, you know, or, or something school related or something along those lines. Like you need to be a practice, you need to be a games, um, that type of stuff. That was, that was a little bit of a shock for them. Uh, the first, you know, and I told, I told the, the, the girls the first time I met with them, I said, look, if you are late, like, we're going to run. For every minute you're late, we'll run. Because that's how it's always been for me as a player. Even in high school, it was like that for me. Um, and so they tried to test that. And I think they weren't used to that, <laughs> or at least the consistency from it. And so, you know, first day, literally the very first day, we, we had actual like practice. Two girls show up like eight minutes late. So I'm like, all right. 16 suicides, <laughs> you know, and they're like, what? <laughs> they didn't think I was going to do it. You know, they really thought that I was just going to like, oh, that's too much. I was like, no, we're going to do, we're going to run them all. I was like, we'll run them during the practice. You know, it's not going to be all done all at once, but we'll knock them out. So we did them all, you know, we ran a bunch next day. One of them shows up on time, but one of them that showed up late, showed up late again, like five minutes late, not as bad, but showed up late again. All right, we're going to run again, ran, you know, another like six suicides. At that point, I think the rest of the team was like, okay, we can't, like, this has got to stop. We're not doing this every day. Because I was like, we're going to do this every day until you guys learn to show up on time. And I never had one girl show up late after that, literally for the rest of the year. So first two days, you know, they, they tested it. I set the tone and it was just like, that's it. You know, we're not, we, this is not acceptable anymore. So that was a change for them. And then, um, you know, other things... I, I don't know, I guess culture wise, just like there were philosophy changes with, with my style of play. I don't know if that's a culture change. Um, you know, maybe it is, but, but yeah, just kind of the philosophy of how I play the game and, and what I want them to do and, and the energy and effort that I want them to have was a little different. Yeah. I think that's all very valid things. And I, I kind of ran across something very similar. It wasn't so much about being late, but just being present really. Cause I remember when I took over and I was like, okay, we're having a meeting, you know, and I put out the word, everybody we're meeting at this time. And I remember getting a text message from one of the seniors. Oh yeah. But do we have to come? And I'm like, 
you're supposed to be like a captain on this team. And like, you're asking me if you're supposed to come, like, yes, you're supposed to come. Like, and, and so I, I remember, you know, as a, before I came in as a freshman coach seeing like, okay, you know, some of these senior guys, they're not really showing up. And this is, we're not talking about practice, but we're just talking about like meetings or whatever. It's like, they're not showing up. And, you know, I think, you know, as, as you come into high school as a freshman, you're like so pumped up, you don't miss anything. You're never late. And then, you know, you become JV and it's kind of, you're, you're still on top of your game because you want to make it to varsity. And once you make it to varsity, you kind of think like, oh, I'm, I'm one of the big dogs now. I don't have to do all this other stuff, but it's kind of the opposite. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, if a freshman misses and stuff like, yeah, I want them there. But like, I'll just be like, okay, I see where your, you know, where your priorities lie it is a freshman. When you get to varsity, you might not make it. But as a varsity, I'm like, hey, if you're going to make varsity, like you got to set the example. And I think that's kind of one of the, the main things that I've been happy with. And it wasn't really because of me. It's not like I changed that. It was actually my players that were the ones that changed that because um, we just have some guys that are super dedicated and, and they were guys that were able to play varsity as sophomores. And part of the reason is they don't miss. They, they literally don't miss. Like, you know, when COVID hit, we're doing these little Zoom workouts and stuff. And yeah, a lot of people aren't there. You know, a lot of freshmen didn't come, some JV guys didn't come, some varsity guys didn't come. But the guys that really have helped change the culture as far as that goes, they show. And mm -hmm. that's not really something I've, I've you know, it, was, it wasn't really all me, but it was cool to see that they're helping kind of the cause with that. So. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to hold them accountable as a coach. And I think we talked about this when we had coach Barakoff on, like, it's easy to come in and say, we're going to change the culture. Okay. Well, that's just words. Right. But you have to hold them accountable and you, you know, if you're going to have all these things, then you got to also yourself make sure that you're always there. Right. But if, if it's only you saying it, and I think this goes for almost anything, uh, if it's only coming from you, then some people will tune you out. But if you're captains or, you know, just some of your varsity players are like, Hey, no, this is how we do things then you can get a lot of change within the program. And, and I kind of had that same experience where, you know, I had seniors this year that it was their first year with me, but they really bought in, like really, really, really bought into what I was doing. And because of that, it set the tone for everyone else. And so I was like, no, like it's not acceptable for you not to do this. And it's not acceptable for, you know, you to miss that or whatever. Um, and I'm a senior and I'm a captain and I'm a starter and I'm showing up. So you better show up, you know, and that was kind of the tone that was set. And so hopefully what I'm hoping is that we'll continue to build on that. And the girls that were on the team last year, now they're going to carry that torch as the, you know, upper, underclassmen moving up to upperclassmen and they'll teach and it'll just become continuous, you know? And I think that's how you really build a culture is it's not overnight. It doesn't happen in a day. It takes, you know, maybe a couple of years or, or longer, but once you have that, those players in your system for a few years, then they just set the tone for everything else. And that's it. You know, then that's when your culture is built. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's awesome. Um, okay, so kind of just to close this out, let's just talk a little bit about like what what were some of the biggest challenges that you had to run up against um, when taking over a program? Um, biggest challenges, and we're talking about on the court and off the court. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, one for one, and again, like you, we talk about, we don't want to make it sound bad for for anyone previously, but at first, like my program didn't have a winning mentality. Like they just were not used to winning games. Um, they would get down on themselves, especially if they lost a game early in the summer. Uh, when we started playing games, like you could see that even if we got up, they felt like they weren't going to be able to hang on to the lead and we would lose games. And then as we kind of got through the summer and then we got into the fall and we, you know, eventually into our season, you could slowly see a shift. Uh, of like, okay, now we're expecting to win games. And it took almost like mid season for them to start expecting that. Um, and we finished out the season really well. I think we finished the season like 11 and two or something like that. And we had a really good, you know, finish or 12, I don't know, something we, we played well. And, um, and you know, that, that took a while because it was hard for, for me to come in and say, Hey, we need to expect to win from now on. Like, this is just it. And it's, again, that's just words, but to get the actual team to buy in, that was a bit of a challenge. That was probably the main thing for me. Um, I didn't have too many other really big bumps. Like I had, you know, I had good support from the parents and from my admin, so I can't say anything negative or, or that was super difficult about that, but, but that was probably the hardest part. Nice. For me, I would say the biggest challenge was just like X's and O's technical kind of stuff as far as what we're what we were going up against right we're got six months together as a team when you know learning our offense learning what we're trying to do our style of play when you're going against these other teams where you know they've been playing together you know since seventh grade they've been playing the varsity coaches system and you know everything's so dialed in like there's so many other extra stuff that they do 
than than what we could do because of just the time you know and so for me that was kind of the biggest challenge was just being able to you know have a team that that knows exactly what we're doing when in comparison to these other teams that have been playing together for so long so mm -hmm. all right well um i think that's about it did you have any other final notes you wanted to mention no i mean i guess i just on that last thought you said i i kind of i ran into the same thing like you said where putting in new stuff and then teams that already had run their stuff. I guess that was another challenge. And when you brought that up, that reminded me that's when you, anytime you put in something new and a team and other teams are running it for like five years, you're going to struggle a little bit at first to, to kind of catch up to their speed. So. Yeah, no, definitely. It's always feel like I'm catching up. I feel like now I'm kind of at the spot though in year three where I'm like, okay, they know what we're trying to do. You know, there's some few tweaks we do here and there, but you know, we're all on the same page finally. So. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, that's all we got for this week. I thank you guys so much for watching or listening. If you like today's episode and you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And if you're listening on iTunes or maybe Stitcher or any other kind of podcast platform, make sure to subscribe there as well because we come out with an episode once a week and we hope to see you guys in the next episode. So, all right, guys, that's it for this week. Have a great day and we will see you in the next episode. Peace.